Welcome back to The Tasting Room, episode 16. I knew the number this time. Yeah! I had to look it up earlier, to be fair. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, you know. We have a, a fun one today. As yeah. you can see, uh, Jake Miller from Heirloom Russick Ales. We've got a plethora of stuff. You brought the, what's that called? A howler? A howler of the British you know what shirt I'm wearing? No. Howler head. Oh, okay. They Hold sent on. it to me. I was like, I'll wear it. Sure. There we go. It looks like McDonald's t-shirt. <laughs> it's sort of red and yellow. A screaming. Uh, so that's McDonald's. the one that I called you about over the weekend. That's the weird banana whiskey. Yeah. So we'll try it. I didn't bring it this time, but we'll, we'll try it. Yeah, we'll try soon. it soon. I want to get your tasting notes. Uh, but this was this was fun. This was a yeah, lot of good conversation. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, it really was. You just want to get right to it? Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say about let's it? You looked on. like you were about to say something. No, no, no. no. Something let's, deep and profound. L- no, let's dive right into All it. All right, Jake Miller after the break. Hey, I'm John. I'm one of the partners here at Grassfire Creative. We are a production company. We do animation, video production, live production, anything you need to creatively tell both your story and your business's story. Along with the content that we create, we also provide the strategy behind how to get it in front of the eyeballs that matter to you. We're located right in the middle of the United States in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so no matter where you are, we're just a short flight away. Bottom line is, we are very excited to both meet you and tell your business a story. Please do reach out to us one of the ways below via email or phone number and check out more about us at our website, grassfirecreative.com. Welcome to the tasting room. Today we have Jake Miller from Heirloom Rusticales. The one and only. Which, which has been kind of a chore. Well, it's been a. It, unluckily for him, Jake's unluckily sake. Unluckily for him. Well, and our sake. Yeah. yeah. My body's been a cruel master. <laughs> it is not my how, fault. <laughs> how was that? that? That's kind of a marathon of uh, getting over stuff. Yeah. Uh, I've never had a kidney infection before. Hope oh, to wow. really keep the slate clean on them. Uh, we don't want to do that future. again. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because it takes just kind of a while to figure out that you've got one. And so you're just in this perpetual state of fever Oof. and uh, just like I would wake up, go into the kitchen, immediately get back in bed for three and a half hours or so. Man, super that tight. sounds super fun. So that is why I felt like having like 14 beers in the <laughs> afternoon was not <laughs> probably not ideal. what the doctor ordered <laughs> yeah. for that yeah yeah dumping emergencies Dude. into loggers instead you just saved it all for today we, we yeah. have a lot to to try and i can't wait to do it we have a lot to talk about i want to talk about you know the the fishing and the conservation side of things obviously the brewery side yeah. of things i want to talk about the f1 side of things Hell with the yeah. australian grand prix coming up saturday but to start you were telling a story prior to austin getting here the fact that you can breathe today and your lungs aren't <laughs> aren't scarred is uh it's, it's pretty impressive. Let's crack open whichever one you want to do first. And then I want you to, it's like the life of a brewer, right? Like a, yeah. a brewery yeah. owner is what you had to deal with today. So what do you want to open first? I think we got to go live oak. Live first. oak pills? Yeah. All right. Let's pass Hard to around. not start with those. And as I'm doing I'm, this. I'm on the edge of my she- seat. I yeah. want to, uh, I want to hear that. this story. So this is obviously real quick, live oak down in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Like if not. It's hard to say something's the best or whatever, but this you, is one of my favorite Pilsners if yeah. you, in existence. If you haven't drank this, yeah, you're not living. No, true. It's I think out of all the hype lager, this is the one that I continue to come mm. back to. Cheers to you, buddy. Cheers. Thanks for bringing these. Thanks for coming Ooh, on. Cheers. All right, so now let Austin in on what your day, what your Monday consisted of and you know, the yeah. life of a brewer. Um, I was basically just cleaning out the HLT, uh, that had built up some pretty solid calcification Perfect, and Been there. all kinds of deposits. And so, uh, the thing is, is my HLT is, for those that aren't in that world, what is an uh, HLT hot liquor tank? Yeah. So okay. it's basically, I'm going to be that person. And yeah. Ask those questions. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. Yeah. Uh, it's basically just a tank that we store water in that stays at anywhere from 170 to 180 degrees. And it's what we mix with barley to make the sugar to make beer. Um, But the problem is, it's not a problem, it's actually what I love, uh, is that Tulsa water is extremely hard. And uh, we don't do uh, reverse osmosis or anything like that. So we just deal with what we've got. And it means that our tank is constantly getting calcified. 
And we have this tank that I use. It's from 1978. Yes. It's one of the very early JV Northwest pieces. Uh, kind of cool. Uh, I love I love that tank, but I hate it when I have to clean it. <laughs> Days like today. Yeah. yeah. There's no... So typically tanks have a drop-down spray ball that just circles around. This has nothing. It is oh, just word. a... It is just a <laughs> cylinder. So... To clean it, I have to physically get in it, and it's like lock in, lock out. Eight feet tall, <laughs> and it's like this big around the the hole that I'm getting through, and so it's like a test of joints and backs, <laughs> claustrophobicness. And, yeah. and, and yeah. then you're down there with vinegar and baking soda, just making little fifth grade bombs, and, <laughs> yeah. and it's like filling your lungs completely, and just it's not fun. It's no, not fun, yeah, but. I uh, have been putting that off for uh, some time. and You survived. Yeah, have been. And Melissa got into the tank yesterday. Oh, man. Just being true brewery owner as well. Yeah. And then I did it today. It's been great. So Jeez. for listeners out there, if you go at least uh, because of our water, which is actually really good brewing water. Yeah. But we don't filter at all. We just yeah. go straight into the HLT. Uh if you go, well, at least in my space, if we go three months or four months without cleaning it, we can have at least a foot and a half of calcification at the bottom wow. of the tank. Yeah, it's wild. It's and the, it's chalky, white, flaky junk yeah. that is actual calcium that yeah. is just built up in your tank. But it makes great Saison, So And Pilsners. Yeah, 100%. I was just yeah. reading this. Um, I, I love, it's just like the most generic yet, I don't know, it's cool in a way when it says using traditional beer making methods inspired by old world style beers. Like yeah. it could be anything. Yeah. It's yeah. not giving any secrets away on that label. No. But it just, I love no. it though. This place is yeah. crazy. Uh, so I reached out to the head brewer before Heirloom even opened and I asked if I could come make beer with him. And so I actually got to brew a batch of pills with him nice. for a day. And it is wild there. Uh, before they got their new system, so their new system is called a Braucon. It's like the Rolls Royce of Germany. It's super incredible. But before they were doing that, they were using kind of a pretty normal system. Mm. And they do this uh, mash style called decoction. And they have a 15-foot-long paddle because they were just rolling in like grain and liquid into their kettle, boiling it. And while they're doing that, some guy is just sitting there scraping it off the bottom wow. with this paddle. And it's crazy. I was like, this is exactly what I hoped this place was like. <laughs> it's I love that. It's a, yeah, it, it was it's a super romantic spot. And they have more horizontals than anybody I've ever seen. I mm. mean, walking through that production space it's just so a lot of people that do lager brewing after they ferment they send it to a horizontal tank so basically the yeast falls out faster and it's i mean they had to have i mean it's just walking through like a sam's warehouse just mm -hmm. full of tanks on their sides and it's I don't know. It's fine. That's awesome. I hope one day I get to see it. Yeah. yeah it's crazy. We well, talked about romantic places. I think that's a good way to start because you've been to a bunch of, maybe you don't consider them romantic, but just different cool places in your beer journey. So yeah. kind of walk us through your start to where you are now, Cliff Notes version if you want, or yeah. expound on anything you want because I know you've seen some cool things and been to some cool places. No, oh, sure. Um, I've been super lucky in that regard. Um Started here at Prairie um, back when it was in West Tulsa with Chase. Um, and it was just me and him uh, and Colin in a really piece of shit warehouse <laughs> uh, <laughs> making beers on the system that I now make beers on at Heirloom. What was your favorite beer from that time that you made? Oh, my God. Um, probably Vu Francais. Great beer. Oh, that was a good yeah. beer. Yeah, that was uh, that was based off of a beer. Chase and I, uh, Sean Hill from Hill Farmstead, sent a box of beer um, 
and he had just done a collab with Blaugy, which is a historic Belgian brewery. Um, and they, we opened this beer and I just was floored. I was like, I don't care about saisons that don't taste like this. Mm. And, um, and so Vu Francais was a reaction to that beer. And, um, I don't know. I love everything about it. Yeah. So I'm excited. Just one more thing on Prairie before you move on down your timeline. Um, the Brooks and Dunn, I think is what it's mm-hmm. called that they've had on, um, yeah, occasionally it's a great beer. um it is a great beer and i was with josh royal and, and hayden and we were drinking and he had it and he said this is the best beer chase has made in who knows how many years oh, <laughs> and would, what it was i, and would 100% I, I told agree. chase this on saturday he mentioned that beer and i told him what josh said and i told him why he said it which was that this was the og chase yeah this is what you used to do and he was excited to hear that because that's what he's trying to get back to yeah doing beers like that like vu Francais. Which, you know, it's not his fault. You you do what you have to do to make money and to sell beer. But I feel sure. like a lot of breweries do that. I don't know if either of you have, uh, not to my knowledge, but you, I don't know the right way to say it either, but it's like you, is it maybe that you listen too much to consumers and you get away from brewing your passion? Or I don't know how that happens at breweries, but, you know, for Solera, it was a lot of IPAs and it was a lot of, a mm-hmm. lot of heavy stouts. And now Chase is kind of able to get back or starting to get back to the fun stuff like that, that was right in his wheelhouse to begin. So I'm excited to, to hear that he's going back in that direction a little bit. Yeah. I think when you do this for a long time professionally, like not, not a few years, but like a lot of years, um, what tends to happen is you have moments where you, it is a job and Mm. that's what it is. And you're just getting through it. And you're showing up and it's like anybody else experiences their job. Maybe that's um, what I'm describing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and then there's these moments where you have like revelations where you're like, oh, my God, I do still care about this. And you have beers that wake you back up. Um, it could be something you brewed or it could be something you have. I think Chase is a normal person Absolutely. like anybody else yeah. in that regard where there's just moments where you're like, operating a business through a pandemic or it's like I've been brewing for nine years and I really have kind of seen through plenty of things like you know and it's and then you look at how much your payroll costs this month and you know all those things start to collide into creating I would say pretty balanced humans I wonder for either Mm -hmm. of you is there a way to avoid that from a creative standpoint as a brewer or is it just part of I think that's owning a brewery hire hire people you know and and let you know, my brewer, Josh, um, his first original recipe is getting released in the next week. Oh, awesome. Sweet. And, you know, finding folks like that, you build into kind of the creative bandwidth for when you're being an asshole, you know, yeah, and yeah. just doing what you have to do. Uh, you know, I think those people are important. Mm. I would I would mirror that exact answer. Is just finding some people that have uh, the same kind of mindset that you've got within within your brew house and whatnot. Um, yeah, for me, you know, we we're pretty. I, I would say pretty firm on not necessarily falling into mm. uh, a lot of trendy styles and this, that, and the other. Right, Obviously, right. we make a hazy IPA. Mm-hmm. We have to to pay some bills, but um, it is pretty cool when your team backs you up in your uh, uh, passion for Mm -hmm. making a Pilsner or uh, making British Goldens or whatever, and just trying to uh, expand everybody's palates and whatnot and just sticking to it. In the way I say it here in our our partner meetings and stuff, and I feel like I'm just on repeat because it comes up at least like twice a month. It's, and I think it's what we're talking about too. It's working in the business versus working on the business. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's just interesting how, mm-hmm. how that happens in different, no matter what the business is, yeah. you know, no matter what you're in, you can get stuck in the monotonous day to day bullshit. Sure. And you lose the creativity. You just, it, it, it's just gone. And then you yeah. have to go back and find it. So it's. Oh yeah. Keeping that away from being a one person thing. And that's something yeah. I've tried to cultivate for a while too, because I think there's also a lot of bullshit around like, Oh, I'm the brewer and I am the like recipe an ego thing developer. Or, yeah. And, you know, 
empowering plenty of people to do that, I think, makes better beer anyway. Mm. Because then when you go to bat and you're like, well, I'm doing an original recipe today. And it's like, man, we've been hitting it out of the park. Mm. Better better show up. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I like that environment. But there definitely is still a lot of, um, you know, like, I'm the man behind this stuff. And I think getting the more you get away from that, and I think Chase has done a great job of empowering like other people, yeah, Caleb and all all that. That you know, Greg, I think is like a super smart, savvy dude. Um, But just like making sure that there's plenty of people speaking into the beer keeps keeps it up Mm. for sure. I interrupted you. We uh, like you were going down your timeline, and we've only gone through one stop. Yeah. So sorry. Continue, <laughs> no, continue fine. on your your life journey here. Yeah. Um, after that, uh, I moved to Oregon um, and worked at a place called Wolves and People. Uh, maybe top five most romantic breweries in the country. Uh, Hundred year old barn. Um, used to be a winery for a really great wine producer out there called JK Carrier. Uh, it's on a 21 acre hazelnut farm that backs right into the Shehala mountains, which is a great wine region as well. Uh, so, I mean, we would have like, how did they get work done? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. Uh, but we'd have like all the surrounding uh, vineyards, like during harvest, like after a day, I mean, most of the time you're working till like night and you go home, you have one beer and you're basically drunk because you've worked so hard for 14 hours straight. You pass out, get up at six and do it again. But about once a week, they would all just pile into the brewery and and drink. And uh, I made this beer called Crush Pad Pills and like, all the winemakers would gather around and only drink that. And it was, I don't know, like probably the coolest thing I've ever Mm -hmm. really been a part of to see that. And I worked a lot of wine down there too and, or up there. And that was a really huge and impactful Mm -hmm. part of, I think my trajectory. You think that, did that start your love for wine or did it just continue to grow it? Definitely harnessed it. Harness it. Yeah. Um, Working wine is, it fits my personality a lot. It's super long days and just beating yourself up, but like super simple. Mm. And I like it a lot. Um, but also that was kind of like harnessing lager as well. Um, we'll try the one here yeah, in a bit. Yeah, absolutely. That really absolutely. kind of manifested all of that. Um, but did that for a while and then uh, moved to Florida Um to work at St. Somewhere. Um, I, I forgot that you went to Florida. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> <That's> where the <laughs> Florida stories comes from. Yeah. I forgot a lot of being in Florida. <laughs> um, That's probably better for you, yeah. mine. Have you, done, have you done the Florida man Google challenge? No. Where you, you Google Florida man and your birthday and you see what headline comes up? Oh, man. Because it's... That's good. Go ahead and tell your story about Saint Somewhere, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play this game real quick live. Yeah. As, we, as we go here. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm excited. Um, this is like a Florida horoscope. I'm into it. Um, went there just because uh, I was getting kind of worn out on the industry. I think I felt like I was seeing a lot of bullshit that I didn't really appreciate, and uh, there there's something really special about Bob at St. Somewhere. Um, Yeah. He was one of the earliest American Saison producers right behind Jolly Pumpkin. I think he started three months after Jolly Pumpkin. Um, And uh, in my opinion, makes the best American Saison out there. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of wanted to see it. Dude's uh, got a wild process and that he doesn't really have a whole lot of chemicals, cleaning. It's just a lot of like Solera fermentation and he makes one beer basically. That's amazing. Yeah. He throws spices and herbs and stuff. It's like Phantom, very similar to Phantom. He makes one base beer and then sometimes adds stuff. Mm. For people that don't know, Phantom's a Belgian saisonnerie out in that world. Delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Delicious beer. Do you want to know what mine was? 
So on April 18th, the headline, I don't know from what year, was a naked Florida man in a Publix parking lot kicked trash cans and jumped on and punched cars while screaming, I only had one beer. <laughs> that was that was my headline. I think that headline could be any day. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> the stuff you it's a fun game to there. play. Play the Florida yeah, birthday game. I Florida like man this. birthday yeah. game. Yeah. Maybe on Florida stories we'll have to just write <laughs> fake <laughs> stories go. that are maybe real. <laughs> I have a feeling if I wrote a fake story, the most dramatic thing I could think of, it probably has just already happened. I do want to ask you about your sure. writing, but so you went from Florida, was it back here? Yeah. That, yeah. So basically I went there just in the interim while we were waiting for the beer laws to change um, before starting mm. and uh, kind of to get my morale back up. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll let you chime in. Do we want to? Op- I mean, you brought a lot of beer. Do we yeah, want to? Do we want to open another one? Where do you want to go Send next, Jake? It. Sure. Um, Eventually, so, we'll get to the bourbon, but I think yeah. it'll be towards the end. Sure. We'll, we'll keep that for a so later one. This is a little bit different than probably what you've been doing, but I thought it'd be a fun way to do this. Uh, I just brought my three favorite yeah, lager absolutely. producers from the Pacific Northwest. Um, so these two are Washington. This is Chuck and Nut, which is arguably the most awarded brewery in the country um it, it i mean yeah, it's it like their pilsner is. i think they have 28 medals for their serious? pilsner like yeah. it's insane and it's called what i have not heard of it chuck a nut i have not yeah. heard of it yeah. you could fuck that name up in a <laughs> bad way <laughs> yeah. but, it's I a mean. mess um but yeah they're they're an incredible producer um and then this is structures you want some of this too right yeah go yep. for it Structures is um, a newer um, brewery, but putting out a lot of really good juice. This is this is like my entire inspiration for sure on the Lager Frontier. Um, this is Heater Allen. It's run by uh, Rick and Lisa Allen. They were right down the street from me when uh, I was at Wolves and People. I would just stop in basically almost every day mm. and hang out with them. Um, but they've been brewing nothing but lager for a decade now. Oh man. Over a decade. That's incredible. Okay. So first question for me, because, so this goes back from, uh, actually last week with Max, uh, from Jackson hole. Yeah. Uh, he was like, so what do you think that we should brew? And, uh, my mind was like, dude, I have no pinpoint on what Tulsa people brew actually drink because oh, this is going to be a what, fun what, topic what here. we yeah. what we throw at them they drink and so i think that we both have a pretty uh common theory of how we release beers but um i didn't really necessarily know how to answer that question because he was like what's popular in tulsa and i was like i actually have no clue yeah because i've got this this, this, this on the board, and they're all selling really well. Do you have any kind of pinpoint on what you think is popular here in Tulsa? I have a great follow-up to this, because, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because this community is wild, and it is awesome, um, and I love it to death, because one week we can release a British Golden, the next week we can release a Bach beer, and yeah. they both sell almost equally. Right. Please give me give, <laughs> me, give, me, give me some enlightenment. I think when I I'm describe have you lean it up a little bit too. So yeah, we, there you go. Uh, man, always <laughs> know, in relaxed mode. I, know. Um, I love it. You've been working hard. <laughs> I I think what I usually tell people is we have such a diversity of drinker because you have we have some of the original beer traders like mm-hmm. that we're taking mm-hmm. uh back before is even barrel age just taking bomb like, bomb yep. and sending it all over the country so you have this group that's like been trading beer for almost 10 years and kind of we're really early on into all the memberships so you have that that's been super developed but in like a really niche audience but then less than two and a half percent per capita are drinking consistently craft beer, which is way low, way, way low. And I so, didn't realize it was that low. Yeah. That's so, a really low number, which is great. That Room just to grow. means yeah. that, you know, more people can open breweries and that the breweries that are open will survive. Um, and then 
you have this whole middle ground of people that have just been drinking at our bar and McNally's mm -hmm. for a long time. And I mean, McNally's is kind of, I, I take people to that bar just because I'm like, you want to watch people order like Belgian quads? Cause there's like no place this on is earth where it you happens. can still do that. Yeah. And you walk in there and it's just like so many big boozy dark beers that aren't adjuncted or barrel aged. I know of no place you can go that I've lived where that happens. Mm. Um, but then you can go watch people line up to spend 50 bucks on a Solera stout. But then you can go watch, you know, you know, 20 family members come in on a Saturday and 15 of them have never had a beer made locally. And so I, I think really whatever you want to do right now, there's a niche. And, mm. and that's why it's kind of hard to explain because you can put out a beer and somebody's going to drink it um, because we just have a little bit of everything. And I don't think that all the trends that are coastal trends apply to Tulsa. Is that why you almost have to have a, a solid compass as a brewery owner? Because you could, that sounds like you could get lost pretty easily. Where you if could. everything you brew sells, then what are you as a brewery if you don't have like, you know, if you're just making whatever sounds good that day or week or, or month, like you're just kind of well, and that's in the model. wind, right? You know, that's yeah. a model. Just like whatever you feel like making today, push it out there because we mm -hmm. make, you know, a lot of diversity. And that's kind of the whole point. People every week want to come in and see a new beer. I think there's plenty of breweries doing that, doing that well. Yeah. And then you have like the opposite where it's like, we make a lot of distribution beer that has to be available. Mm. And then there's middle ground. But I think you can, mm -hmm. right now in Oklahoma, I think you can be successful doing any of those. Yeah. Um, what that'll be like in five years, that'll be the more interesting, I think. Yeah, it was it was nuts this last like week. Uh, we released the, the British gold nail that we did with Balcones and sold a half a barrel of that beer over the weekend. And then we released the 918 Cerveza and we sell a barrel of that beer in one weekend. On Those styles weekend. could not be more different. And it's like, that's why, like, that's why I was excited to ask the question is just like, okay, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think too, you've done a great job of cultivating at your place. Um, like I, I think you have like a super strong local audience sure. that's very much invested in whatever you all are excited mm. about. And I think that's like a magic formula too to tap into where it's like that when they see a new beer release, they're like, tell me about it, tell me about it. And then they get romantically involved with it and super excited to drink it. I think you you guys have done a great job mm. of Oh. making that happen. Well, you'll make me blush, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> blush, just don't cry. Um, so I, I think one of the things that is the most unique about your brewery, about Heirloom, in addition to like, this has no, this isn't a knock on the beers you make or anything like that. It's the descriptions uh, on the menu. Yeah. So take Impressive. me, yes, take me through the process. Like, do you get stoned as hell? Like, how do you, like, some of, <laughs> some of the things that you write on those descriptions, I'm just like, yeah. how does he come up with this? I, I wish I had an answer. Uh, but you're also like a poetry guy, and so you not like your literature. Yeah. So that probably helps. No, I definitely yeah. read a lot. Um, what's funny about those descriptions is it was really originally a knock on the brewing industry. I was writing those to make fun of people who were trying to have I love that. Yeah. experiences all the time with beer. Um, you know, it's like, I don't know. I don't want to make beers that people clamor for and have to pay a lot of money for. Sit around and pour four ounces. That's the only bit of it they'll ever get. Mm. And then they're so analytical because they're so invested at that point. And it's like, that's just not what I think beer is yeah. and it, there's nothing wrong with people who enjoy that and want to do that it's not a knock on them i just don't see beer as that's not how i want that to function mm. that's how i'd rather do that with other things yeah. and um and so 
I was doing it to kind of make fun of all of that that was going on. And then we released a beer and I didn't write one and people gave me so much shit. <laughs> like, well, now you fucked yourself because yeah. like you've got to do that for every single oh, beer. I, there's yeah. weeks too where like we just get crushed over the weekend and I have to come in and put three new beers on draft. And it's like, you know, I'm dealing with shit like I am today. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, cool, I guess I'll go try to give a shit about, you know, <laughs> What weird reminding you of grandma's these, attic or something. Yeah. 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 So there's times you can actually, you can actually go to heirloom and see how I'm doing that week <laughs> by how many gaps how there Jake's are. Mental state. <laughs> yeah. Let's look at this. Yeah. Do you have an read? example on your phone of one that you can read or something for people that are listening or watching that haven't seen them? I would probably. So, so if there's like a short description, I should like call you up and be like, Hey Jake, is is, is everything, everything okay? Uh, is everything okay? Yeah, and I'm like, I'll get back to you after this therapy <laughs> session. <laughs> yeah, no, it's what it'll what it'll say. Hey, this is how you know if I'm not having a great week because it'll say description coming soon. But there'll be like three of those, <laughs> and it's sometimes they just never do come. I should have had you bring a menu because I was thinking about that question because I wanted to oh read one God. or yeah. have you read one. Um, I could probably. <laughs> I see if Jess or someone could see if they're on yeah. the website. I think she, this is how little, I would die if I did not have Jess. Can we break into this? Which one do you want to go with yeah. next? The tall one or the other one? Uh, let's go with the, one the with Chuck and Nut. Chuck yeah. and Nut. Is it this one? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I was touching the wrong Chuck hand. and Nut Brewery Chuck Light Lager. I mean, that's just oh, the man. most simple. And yeah. yeah. It's going to be delicious. It is going to be delicious. Yeah, they're my my friend brews there and he is i mean just the amount of data that they collect on a single beer what do you mean by that well like all of us do have like our own numbers that we're interested in whether it's like ph during fermentation mash whatever they have like huge logs of every single data point at every single part of the process. Are they breaking even down the like hours of the day? I don't know if it goes that far, but you look at a brew sheet and you're like, whew, that is a different way to make beer. It's it's very involved. It does not smell what I what I expected that to smell like based on the There's a little bit of dandelion. There's a little bit of funk in there. And I just like chuck light lager. I was just expecting I don't know what I was expecting. But oh yeah, oh, the, yeah. the finish is so, just yep. oh yeah, such a great grain finish. That's uh, wonderful fantastic. minerality. Yeah, you got anything? A, a beautiful sulfur. Uh yeah. All right. Um, All right. Here we go. This is a Jake Miller it. exclusive. What what beer? <laughs> what beer is this? This is Frozen Bloom, which is our uh, Baltic Porter. All right. Get up and and kiss this microphone and All give right. a real deep voice as you as you read this. Yeah. Get my Attenborough. <laughs> there you on. go. Yeah. All right, we haven't brewed this beer since the winter of 2019 and knew we needed to bring it back. This strong dark lager is brewed with unmodified barley and a smattering of specialty malts. Fermented ice cold with our house lager yeast and kept cold for weeks after fermentation for a squeaky clean finish. This beer reminds us of eating no-bake cookies next to an ounce of buffalo trace and sipping freshly roasted Jurgischeff out of a purulene straw. So... There you go. I'm there in the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what's the, obviously the, the genesis of that comes from your palate and comes from the, the tasting notes that you have for the beer. How the hell do you figure out what to, the, the one that always is in my mind is the grandma's attic. Oh yeah. And I don't remember what beer that was, Probably that that was, yeah, yeah, I think it was, yeah. but like that is such a, I would never tie that description to a, a taste or a flavor profile, but I was there when I read it. I was like, yeah. it oh, hits home. that's yeah. 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 I think, you know, the other thing too, is it's like, if you read other industries, tasting notes of their stuff, I'm like, yeah, bullshit. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'll, I'll totally drink a coffee that's supposed to be like, this is loaded with wild blueberries. And I'm like, it's not tastes like coffee, you know? Yeah. And, and there are moments actually where I've had them like that, where it is like, holy shit, like how, how did this happen? And that's awesome. But I think there's just a lot of marketing in that world more so than the actual 
this is someone who really worked through this. Mm. So what I do is I take, take the beer and then if I get distinct notes, I just take it to the most extreme place I ever could imagine. And, and so the job is to take something if it's like, Oh, well I use mosaic. And so there's like some blueberry lime, you know, what's the, weirdest most concentrated <laughs> form of that and so it's just sitting around being like oh yeah i this. love that well, and is it only you yeah okay yeah. man for now you wish you could outsource <laughs> yeah. that one yeah, yeah. yeah. that might well, be like a hire that out sort of uh-huh. gig well while out at our brewery we we normally keep it to four tasting notes. Four, four <laughs> words. Yeah. And it has four words. <laughs> yeah. Which is smart uh, for a lot of reasons. Oh. Uh, the, the best though, what I didn't realize is that most people that read them think that those things are in the beer. So they'll be like, Man, I don't really get the buffalo trace. And I'm just like, God, yeah, because that's you illegal. I don't read, get the grandma's you attic. Didn't read the yeah. story. Right. So then there's this whole my bartender saved me. That's really what it comes down to. It's, it's like, yep, yep, none of the things in there are in that beer. It's and, just Jake being Jake. Yep. Yeah. And so it's also like we'll get, you know, fifty five year old white guy in there that's just like I hate these descriptions. They don't help me at all. And it's like, I let this well, breathe. How about how about you just grow up a little bit? Yeah. It's gonna be fine, homebrew guy. <laughs> it's gonna be just fine. And you know, can't appeal to HPG yeah. homebrew guy. Yep. Uh, so for as you well know, we we usually do a six pack of questions, but it turns okay. into about 60. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Not, not really, but you know, yeah. uh, there's tangents on tangents. There's tangents. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. for my official second question is you have been pretty much a national brewer. You've, you've gone to a lot of different areas and uh, just to concentrate on w- why did you pick Tulsa to land? Cause being, you know, you're you're from here and this, that, and the other, and that is, you know, grounding. But you you left the nest egg and and went off into the world, and you could have picked so many different areas of. It's a good question, America. Yeah. Why why were you excited about Tulsa specifically? And it's really cool to have you as a neighbor, basically right down the road, um, and exciting to have someone that's so eccentric with their brewing which is really cool and challenging um to Thanks. someone that's very continental european brewer um why why did why were you excited about tulsa and what what drew you back here yeah yeah um i'm sorry <laughs> I, got you. I told you you're gonna have to tell me i, I got you the whole time. long legs over there yeah i just keep slowly <laughs> sliding back um yeah i think I think there's a lot to that. I mean, for one, um, it feels weird not to make something uh, in a place where you're from. Hmm. Um, You know, it's like, I don't know, being in the Pacific Northwest and being like, look, I've lived here for, you know, a couple years and like I brewed here. So that gives me the right. I just never felt that way. Um, I think, too. I probably would have opened a brewery right out of Prairie, um, here, but it like the laws didn't make any sense for what I wanted to do. And so I, I was talking to multiple people, uh, before I left Prairie, when they found out that I was like searching that wanted to do that with me. Um, and at the end of the day, I just was like, I don't feel ready. Mm-hmm. And um, and the kind of compromises I'd have to make to open a brewery here now are not ones I'm willing to make. So it kind of was something I had seriously considered well before I did it. Um, and what I kind of realized, too, though, is that I'm kind of a masochist in the sense that I want to like nobody's going to work as hard as I am when it comes to like a craft 
I'm going to, it's the same with like fly fishing. Like I will bury myself alive three times and barely crawl out before, you know, I feel competent and, Mm. and that's how my personality has always been. And so I decided to also just go try to learn as much as I could before opening. And, you know, and part of my biggest issue, I think with not an issue, but just something I saw is there were so many people that just had zero, um, vision, you know, it's like every day is like they'd wake up as a new person in their cellar, which is fine. Um, but I knew that's not how I wanted to do it. And so I wanted to go brew at a few different places, have a whole bunch of people around me that were brewing. I mean, it's hard to beat like the Tampa scene and the Portland scene and just where you're challenged every single day and people are pushing you, you know, to become even better. And I wanted those experiences and I, I was seeking those out. Um, but yeah, what's funny is I feel like I'm like, it's hard. Like if you look at our tap list, I think as far as European goes, hard to beat it. I mean, Mm. we we're known for like the four beers a year that are like foraged, um, or something like that. But as far as like walking in and seeing like a European inspired list, I think that's what we do. No, oh, I can back that up. Yeah. I love being able to come over to your place and yeah, either absolutely. drink a Pilsner, a Kolsch, a Pilsner, or a Kolsch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but it's like, like your sweatshirt, what, lager gospel? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's been times where we've had 10 lagers on draft, you know. And that's awesome. It's, uh, and that's been, you know, I was helping a friend with a uh, business plan the other day. And so I was using ours as kind of like a model. And the two categories of beer that I put in there, and this is, you know, five and a half years ago, lager, Saison. Interesting. And, mm-hmm. You know, and I you've think, stayed true to that. Yeah. 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 I mean, we definitely. With a couple of Baltimore Yeah. Quarters. I mean, you go. You yeah. go <laughs> That's a lager. I mean, it, it is. is a lager. That's yeah. true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, I mean, we, we make IPA and stuff. I'm not, yeah. I've never had like an issue like saying like, yeah, if you want hoppy beer, like. And, you know, these like dry hopped lockers aren't what you're looking for and you want like a mosaic bomb, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Like, we'll totally have that ready for you. But, you know, what we do, like percentage wise, 100% has been German inspired from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I have on my resume that I was involved in a beer at Heirloom because you took dandelions from my yard and and, <laughs> and brewed with it. So if you get a call about that, that's that's where that came from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I could get C&Ds from like <laughs> 75 citizens in Tulsa for that beer. <laughs> <laughs> that was a there that was a communal effort. It was a communal beer. Yeah, yeah. I've been wa- driving around seeing dandelions and being like, "Oh, do I want to do that again?" <laughs> it's such a that is I cannot tell you how much cellar that takes that beer to make. Really? Yeah. Yeah, cuz it's like Is it worse than the berries? I think it's worse than everything. Okay. Cuz it's like 75 pounds of dandelions a lot of dandelions myself and jess probably picked like 25 pounds of them you know and it's like four or five days of Mm. picking straight and then hopefully other people show up with them and uh and then i make the base beer is a french petite lager turns out nobody gives a shit and (laughs) then we did it as a pet nat so as it's fermenting we bottle it which re- which requires so much finesse to get it because then it ferments the rest of the way. That's an understatement. To make, like, not blow the bottle up, mm-hmm. but also be carbonated to a level that I'm happy with. Mm. And so that beer is like a keep you up at night beer for, like, oh, hope everybody shows up for the 2.9% lager release. <laughs> and it's that we spent. Way yeah. too much Twelve time days on. to make. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's uh, but it was delicious. Yeah, it's a fun beer. I love making that beer too. But it's like rip your hair out, yeah. frustrating. So I don't have any. 
That's why. That's, that's where we're going to go with that. <laughs> uh, I want to get into your, you mentioned fly fishing. I want to go there next. Um, yeah. We still have a lot to go. Do you want to do yeah. yours or do we want to go one more? Because we have three left over here. Oh, we're having fun. And we have this, know. which I'm letting breathe. And then okay. we have yours. Where do you want to go? Uh, we can drink mine. Okay. Yeah, let's it's do fun. it. It's uh, fun. So I did bring our British Golden today. Uh, and that's what we named it. Because okay. We just were like, um, F it. This is what it is. Yeah. So we called it British Golden. Sometimes that's the best <laughs> approach. Right. No mystery. IPA. No mystery. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is our collaboration, uh, our collaboration with Balcones and uh, our head brewer, David McLean. Uh, is friends with their operations manager. Oh, cool. Uh, so he's obviously a very busy dude ordering all of the ingredients for the distilling side and taking over the mashing for the distilling side, but also has a little bit of a hobby on the side to uh, make beer. And they actually have a brewing or oh, cool. a beer brewing side to I their deal. I know that. Yeah. And they have a little tap room with it. So we brought him over. And this is about as close as you can get um, to mm. their uh, base whiskey mash bill. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. yeah. So uh, is that the nose I get? Yeah. Because well, it, it almost has like a. It's very marmalady because we took their mash bill and then took our house English uh, okay. strain, yeast strain. Uh, and our, our English strain, uh, yeast strain that we use yeah. is very marmalady. Where would so, I get. And my nose might be off, but it's almost like in the chocolate family or something. Like yeah. I'm getting some I get sort a of like coffee. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. coffee or chocolate. Yeah, that's one thing that I love about noses and palates. I don't get coffee, but that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, <laughs> fair. I mean, fair. it's subtle, but I yeah. get what you're saying. Yeah. Just like definitely more like of a like a decadent kiss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All right. So you mentioned fly fishing and how you like to bury yourself alive three times and then <laughs> yeah. crawl out. Um, so if you're not brewing beer, chances are they can find you on some river yeah. or, or some lake with a, usually a fly rod in your hand. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your love of that. And then let's get into the conservation side. But first, like, did you fish all your life? How did you get introduced to it? Is it yeah. really your escape? Like, is that what you, yeah, yeah that's the uh, earliest memories. Definitely. Uh, both my parents are from Florida. Um, and we grew up super poor, like super poor. Um, but within the family, they had this kind of beach shack mm -hmm. and we would go, uh, every other year for two weeks and we would, uh, my favorite memories, childhood memories, period are the dock would go out and then there were these lights off the dock and we would night fish and you would see shrimp. Mm. Uh, swimming through and then you would just see monster flashes of just all kinds of species and we would fish until midnight 1 2 a.m i mean i remember sneaking out to fish like my parents would make me go to bed and i would be like this is bullshit <laughs> there's and, fish out there yeah, there yeah. fish out there right now and uh you know and i would go out and my older brother would still be out there and you know would be like you're your snitch if you tell like but <laughs> I, I, the guilt trip yeah. yeah yeah i mean some of my earliest tears for sure would be hearing fish splashes from somebody having one on while i'm supposed to be in bed and i can hear that shit through the window and i'm just like this is the worst this is torture yeah not and today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh and my uncles were all like commercial fishermen of some sort. Um so I was taught how to throw a casting net mm -hmm. super early and was catching bait super early and um really have never experienced anything that I cared about on that level. That's and awesome. So yeah, and then I don't know. I guess like college hit just working two jobs, putting myself through school, dating girls, kind of left it for a while. Mm. And then a buddy like took me in Oregon. I was like, whoa. I like, forgot. I, I totally forgot yeah. that this was like an obsession forever. And it just got real out of hand. Like, <laughs> I was, especially over there. Because you yeah. can just be like, 
on a salmon run river in 45 minutes, you know, and incredible mm. place. And then, you know, I quietly tell people uh, that all of my job acceptance stuff, like, so when I knew I was going to leave Prairie, I sent resumes to Fauna Flora, Ale Apothecary, and Wolves and People, and all of those aren't on incredible rivers <laughs> and so it's like <laughs> it was a very strategic yeah. decision and then i went to saint somewhere which is in a place called tarpon springs Ooh. yeah further fish for some tarpon, tarpon. Yeah. yeah and so like that's always been like a a big play in yeah where i've lived so how did the conservation come into it here locally because if you're not the spearhead you're one of the you know faces of that whole movement, if you want to call it that, or yeah. just bringing attention to the need for, you know, certain river conservation or whatever. How did you get, I mean, I guess it just goes hand in hand yeah. with, with the fishing. Yeah. I mean, I, whenever I'm teaching people how to fish, part of that is always understanding the issues on water. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people that live on earth now and, you know, you got to take some responsibility if you're going to enter into these places. And, um, that's just made sense to me since I was young. And I think it really makes sense too. Like when I went back and revisited when I lived in Florida, that old beach house, mm. you know, I haven't been there in 12 or 13 years. Didn't even recognize the water. Um, totally like limited fish in there. Like stocks are just really low. Um, you know, once you interact with watching fisheries change, super motivating to get involved. And, um, and so it's been that way, I'd say since I was a teenager, mm. you know, I've always worked in nonprofits while I'm doing like mm -hmm. my money making job and volunteer for 10 or 15 hours a week at whatever local nonprofit. So what would you describe the scene as locally on the conservation side? <laughs> uh, it's tough. It's super tough to do conservation in Oklahoma. Um, you know, it's. I don't think this is a super political statement, but I'm sorry if I offend you. <laughs> Not um, really, guys. <laughs> we're just, uh, it's an anti-regulation state. Mm. And I think kind of the conversation that will probably happen over the next 10 years is like, well, how do we not regulate things so much where people can't open businesses and can't farm and those kind of things, but also like regulate enough where we don't kill fisheries and watersheds and um that's kind of the take that i try to have and so i talk to a lot of people that are like i should be able to fish anywhere keep every fish i catch no questions asked and same with hunting and it's like well that's a great way to make sure your kids don't get to go ever mm. yeah and you know but that's what they've been taught you know all along is that any form of regulation is government not acknowledging the individual. And while I get some of that um, in theory, I'm also yeah. kind of like, well, if individuals aren't regulated, that means that, you know, a couple individuals can wipe the whole thing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's in Oklahoma, it's tough because you're there's square one and then there's where we're at which is really far back there. And so trying to get any conservation done here is extremely difficult. Like when I'm talking to politicians, I don't even tell when they're like, what is Trout Unlimited? I'm like, uh, it's a fishing club. You know, I don't tell them it's a conservation organization. Right. You know, because as soon as they hear conservation, they're like, Sierra Club? No, not at all. Like yeah. I'm here to talk to you about making sure – the state makes good money on these rivers and streams mm. and you know and that's how i kind of have to have to do it so i've had to, i've had to like learn how to create a narrative for people that i am not on the same page with um to try to get things done mm. i think conservation fails a lot here because most conservationists are uh very polarizing yeah. in their beliefs and compromise capability and for me it's like well if i can only get them halfway at least i got them half you know because it's way better than them just shutting mm -hmm. the door and continuing to pollute at the same level so yeah. if someone's listening or watching how can they help how can they get involved what do you need like how what does that look like 
Yeah. Um, so the big project right now for me is the Arkansas River. Um, Absolutely. And that's a that's got that's got a lifetime of struggles and issues that people could get involved with. Um, but the best way to get involved, in my opinion, is to go to that river <laughs> and experience it. <laughs> um, but more than that, uh, so we're starting a 501c3 called Tulsa River Guardians. Um, and the whole purpose of that, and my biggest thing is, is I think a lot of people see the Arkansas River and have given up on it. Mm. Um, you know, it's like I've been fishing before and like an entire playground has come down, you know, in the river. <laughs> and, you know, it's like there's shopping carts mm. turned over. There's all kinds of debris. There's highway, like pieces of highway with rebar sticking out. I mean, it's taken a beating. Um, and that's what happens to urban rivers. Um but I think the problem is, is that's allowed some of these projects to go by with zero scrutiny because people are just like, well, fuck it. You know, like that river's done. And then they see pictures of the fish that me and friends are catching out of it. And they're like, hey, where is that? <laughs> I'm like, oh, the same that's place. That river you said was fucked. Same yeah. Place. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, I've, I've fished in the top fisheries in this country, all of them. And um, there has never been a fishery as good as the Arkansas River, ever. Um, the amount of fish that you can catch, you know, I, I feel confident that I can get into it with like a 10, 12 pound fish more often than mm. I can't on most days. How far do you have to go away from the city? Sometimes not at all. Really? I mean, when there's not gigantic bulldozers in the gathering place mm. river, uh, like I've caught huge fish out of there. Um, and that's one of the ways that I'm trying to do conservation different, you know, like we're supposed to have a meeting pretty soon with Ken Levitt and, you know, I'm going to be like, dude, I want like world record fish being caught in your park. And that's 100% possible. And, um, trying to use the economics versus just like sanctity of mm -hmm. the ecosystem, because, yeah, there's just a lot of people who don't care. I mean, it's, That's which is crazy too. for me. Yeah. Like, you're living be, here. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like, I don't know. And coming from the West Coast and the East Coast and spending lots of time on both, everybody's tearing down dams or looking at tearing down dams on both coasts because what they've found is that clean water rivers do more economically than anything that the dams contribute. And so, you, you're talking about like pulling down major hydro dams too. Mm -hmm. Never mind ones that aren't really doing much. So it's it's weird too to know you're in a conversation that won't matter in like 20 years. Yeah, and it's like this dam's not gonna be here in 20 years because it's just gonna be pulled down because there's better ways to make money on this river. Mm -hmm. And mm. but you got to kind of go in with a lot of humility and be like, so tell me, like, what are you most excited about with the new yeah. Zinc Dam and hear them talk about, you know, whatever they're pumped about and try to be like, you know, you realize how, how do we, how do I get you to this place where you care about native species? And luckily, I mean, I hope, you know, the Kaiser family foundation seems like the perfect Avenue for like, look, man, you're teaching kids in this lab, you know, there's going to be outdoor classroom stuff going on here eventually. Like, don't you want to be, a part of saying that you preserved 30 plus native species that, mm. you know, come through this watershed. And so that's kind of how I do it, which is a definitely different approach, but I'm also like, I hate politics and I hate politicians. So I, at the same time, I'm kind of the weird, weirdest conservation guy you're ever going to meet. Cause I'm just like, no, I just want to make sure that, 50 years from now, somebody can come out here and catch a 20 pound striper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something yeah. to be said for that. Yeah. 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 And I think it's like a cool way of putting Tulsa on the map that sometimes our city leaders aren't aware of, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, man, 
way cooler way than putting millions of dollars into projects on a river is to have a river that's just full of anglers having a blast and kayakers like what's amazing to me is that i mean and we have a lot of fish yeah and mm -hmm. we have a lot of fishermen and like bass comes here for bass masters and yeah. major league fishing is headquartered down in south tulsa yeah like i mean it's or the production arm of it. I think they're actually in Dallas, but the production company that does that for them is, is here in Tulsa. Cause I've, I've been to their studios and it's to have, it's just such a weird juxtaposition to have yeah. that many fishers, fishermen, fisher women, whatever. And then bass masters coming here because of our freshwater, not necessarily rivers, but lakes and then yeah. major league fishing, but then to just let the rivers go to shit. Yeah. Like, it's just weird. It's well, and that's like a total, like, it's the culture shift too, because mm -hmm. like my older brother, he's, you know, he's a guy who fishes in a lot of tournaments and like a sparkle boat guy, like, you know, this <laughs> sparkle boat. <laughs> this, like sparkle boat. Yeah. It's it. a total bass thing, you know? Yeah. And so like taking, I took him out to the Arkansas and he was totally out of his element, you know, but he's like a million times better angler than I am. Um, but out there is just like completely lost because it's so big and vast and mm. it's not very clear. You know, it's like the whole thing's maybe eight feet deep and it's like, where do I even start on this? And it took me like, I don't know, year, year and a half to figure it out, but getting those folks interested. And that's, that's the hard thing is there's no trout and the large mouth game is not there. Mm. And if we had either one of those, this would be a done deal. Like, mm -hmm. you know, those are money fish for mm -hmm. sure. But as far as GDP goes, striped bass is a top fish in the country for GDP production. And mm. so I'm hitting that real hard in these conversations and being like, you know, this is a, this is a crazy expensive fish on the East coast and we can actually catch like competitive weights on these things. So that's that's an interesting segue into my, I guess, my last question would be, <clears throat> you know, Tulsa growing as an economy, and we probably should pour something else. Yeah, I was, I was, yeah. You can go ahead. I'm going to yeah. grab one. Yeah. Uh, Tulsa trying to grow as an economy, we've poured a lot of money into a lot of different things, such as like BMX biking, biking yeah. music scene, uh, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, our restaurant scene is out of this world, um, in my opinion. Uh, do you see, you know, the fish, like when I, when I tell people that are coming out of town to Oklahoma and I'm like, well, actually we, we are one of the number one fishing communities in the nation mm -hmm. here. Uh, they're like, no kidding. And it's like, you didn't know that? Uh, how do you, I mean, hearing all of the things that you're talking about, you know, do you think that that is a point to where we could, as a city, concentrate on uh, to bring people into this area? Um, because stripers are awesome for it, fish. Yeah. Um, and, you know, bringing people into that world and really – kind of opening their eyes, what what do you think that we would need to do as a city to get that accomplished? Well, I think it kind of already happens. It's just more about there's no data for it. So that's the most frustrating part is I'll walk in and be like, yeah, I was fishing today up at Keystone Dam and there were 50 anglers on either side of it pulling out six fish limits, all of them six pounds plus. Like that's insane you know, yeah. and it constantly reproduces itself. Like that's been happening for years. And, you know, you talk to any angler that's been fishing this river for more than 10 years and they all have a 25 pound plus story. And it's easier to catch a big fish on that river than any place on earth. And I do think that there's actually a lot of people that fly in to do it. I know people that fly in to do it. So do I. Yeah. The data is just not there. You know, I would love to have a statistic for like this many millions, you know, between like Bass Pro, restaurants, wherever you're staying, like, but it just doesn't exist. 
And then when you're talking, you're sitting there in front of a city council board and you're like, and I can tell that none of you are <laughs> in this group. And so you're trying to figure out ways to be like, no, this is not just like some dude wailing about whatever local issue. And mm -hmm. I'll be here next week to talk about whatever's wrong then. It's like, this is a really big deal. And, um, and I wish that there was data for me to give you. And since none of you actually are on that river, you don't know this for yourself either. So it's just me like, I don't know, being a passionate guy. And they're like, yeah. that's really sweet. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <Thanks>. gee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look at this guy. He cares about nature. And it's like, yeah, great. Yeah. And so it's hard to get anywhere on that. And, you know, I think, I think too, it's, and the thing I come back to a lot is there's so much political apathy here. And if more people just like let city councilors, representatives know their take on something, they would be shocked at how much would change. Um, mm -hmm. Like I'm the <clears throat> conservation chair for Trout Unlimited and the amount of times that we've made like 15 phone calls and you know, and that, that senator or representative is like, holy shit, what is going on? You know, and it's like 15. You yeah, know? when when people say, like, call your senator or call the person or email them, it actually goes directly to their office. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And no. it makes a huge impact. Yeah. I've got now, I've got three city councilors' phone numbers, and, like, I can just text them, and which was really great because when the city took my water meters without asking, uh, <laughs> I was like, Hey y'all different subject completely, but I can't brew and all of my water meters are gone. And, you know, and then two hours later I've got, you know, people call in and they're like, Holy shit, we're so sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> What and, was that mix yeah, up? Yeah, exactly. So that was a wild deal. Uh, came in, all of our water meters are gone, zero warning, uh, zero notice. And um, so. Got to pay your bills, Jake. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right? Well, well, we've been trying not to pay the city of Tulsa <laughs> since we opened, uh, and it finally caught up. Uh, we So what happened was we had a break-in, and they took our safe in November. In the safe was our checkbook. Um, so we had to open a new account. And so we get everybody that we pay bills, all of that info. So city of Tulsa, December takes money out. No problem. For whatever reason, their system reverts back to the old mm. info in January. Well, they call us and tell us that, well, we call them and they're like, your information's all updated. So sorry about that. And then February, no notice, take our water meters because it did the same thing. So even though our information is accurate in the system, it continues to not give a shit about that information. That's weird. Super weird. The guy that I talked to was like, I've never seen this in my entire life, and I've been doing this for decades. And I was like, glad it happened to me. <laughs> awesome. I was trying to brew today. Yeah. <laughs> Small business stuff, man. All the time. I, know it. I went ahead and poured the... Uh the Yellowstone because we're almost done here and we've got to get to the, the big beer you have over there. Yeah. So I wanted us to taste this. I don't know if it's a good idea to do it first before we have the last beer or not, but no, no, it's let's, all right. Let's barrel. This was this one. Of, yeah. Right. This was uh from my spirits of legend uh, bourbon group. It was a barrel pick that they did out there. 115 proof from Yellowstone. Uh, it's pretty good. Distilled on the Dutton good. Ranch. On the Dutton Ranch, yeah. So the, it's got a lot of guys pepper see, fire to it. I love it. Beth is the sticker on the back that says, uh, you're the trailer park, I'm the tornado. So a nice little Beth Dutton <laughs> quote from Yellowstone. <laughs> How's your love of, uh, in, like, palate for bourbon? It's uh, So I have a lot of bourbon. Mm. Um, I drink more rum, but... I do like bourbon, and in the winter, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a go-to for sure. For sure. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, you know Orphan Barrel? I don't. So, 
I, the name is vaguely familiar, but I, I couldn't tell you why. Super crazy, like they just age for eternities and then there's just one barrel of whatever. But I think the youngest I've ever seen them do is 15. Oh, wow. And uh, Melissa had this bottle. Um, it's called Lost Profit. I think it's 18 year. Jeez. It is mind blowing. It's like the first, like, you know, you have a lot of whiskey and bourbon that's mm-hmm. neck and neck and you're like, that's good. And it's like, Maybe a little bit better than this. This was like miles ahead of yeah. everything I've ever yeah. had. And then I looked it up and it's like a $500 bottle. So, <laughs> see, so uh, Aaron Post was here about a month ago, mm-hmm. roughly. And I've got to stop telling the story on this podcast because I think we've told it way too many times. And that's what be, Aaron Post be, is good for, though. Yeah. He's going to bring a. <laughs> so, a he, brought, he brought a dusty turkey, is what he called it. It was a 79 wild turkey. <laughs> Dude, it <laughs> was. Right. It was. Out of this world. Oh my god! Did I say that right? Was it a seventy-nine? It was. It was distilled in seventy. So that's what it was. It was distilled, distilled in, 79. in seventy-nine. It was like an eighty. It was a twelve-year, uh, right? Bottled, bottled in ninety. Ninety-one. It was a twelve-year. One or twelve. Yeah, but or, yeah. that means it was like distilled in seventy-nine. I mean, it was to this day probably the best bourbon I've ever had. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Post turns out no his <laughs> shit. And what's funny? <laughs> so he's sitting where you are. And, you know, he just has it out here. It's in its little cylinder thing. It's got, like, the, you know, foil on it and all this stuff. And, you know, he poured, I poured just, like, probably this much, right? Because yeah. I, I know what I'm looking at. Right. I this don't. dude is like, I'll take some more of that. <laughs> and so <laughs> just like. <laughs> and Aaron's like, but oh, Aaron, yeah, to his sure. credit, was like, hey, bourbon's made to be consumed. So here, John, yeah. take some more. And I'm like, no, I know. He's like, no, seriously. But, you know. He's the most giving. He dude. really is. Yeah. It's almost frustrating how. I don't know. Like every time he opens a bottle, it's like, I mean, he took me into his wine cellar the last time we had dinner. And was like, these are things that I got in the last week. <laughs> God damn it. You <laughs> suck. <Yeah. laughs> what, a, what a wonderful uh, world. What do you He's think of this? Super cool. It is good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think. It's of, got a little dark cherry to it. It does have dark fruit for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I haven't called that in a long time. Like, and for 115 proof, it's not overly hot. Like there's enough yeah. there to let you know that it's it's a relatively high proof, but it's not. Yeah. Well, and high proof anymore is hilarious. Honestly. You know, I feel like we're going to be like buying 160 proof. So like this year. group is, they said soon we're going to have a wheat, a wheated whiskey that's in the 150s. Oh okay. my. I don't know if I'm going to buy that bottle because it sounds like napalm. Like, I, I don't know. Sounds like divorce papers. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Sounds like a good way to end oh, every friendship you've ever yeah, had. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so as we finish this up, I'll ask a last question. I want to open that big one. Yeah. Uh, the pleasure feeder, I don't know if we're going to get to, but that's on tap right now at Heirloom, right? Okay. Yep. So we no, there's plenty of that. Go try that there. Um, why Ferrari? Oh, shit. Let's just, let's just get into the F1 talk. Yeah. Come on. Because he's an F1-er, I'm, I'm too. I'm an so, F1-er. Yeah. So why, I love why Ferrari? Um, I, I mean, come on. I think for Fast. me, the Mar- the original uh, Marlboro car. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. like I don't know. That was back in the Schumacher days, Williams? right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Was that Williams? No, that's Ferrari. That was Ferrari back oh, in like, the Ferrari. Schumacher. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm sorry. And uh, I think that's the sexiest car of all time, mm. and it's just hard for me to like even imagine dude, this one's about. close though with that matte red oh the matte red and the fish gills yeah dude i'm all about it it's it's not as cool for me as that but that's like i don't know it's like watching a western version versus well, it's James nostalgia Bond. versus yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 you know it's like <laughs> that's su- a great description all right hand me that big one as we talk <laughs> is that a pop i need to use my keys uh it's not popped yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no i mean is it is it a pop top oh no no You'll need to. There you go. There we go. It's probably going to come after you too. Is it? It's okay. carbonated. All right, I'll be ready. Um, <laughs> oh, so talk, Jesus, John. Uh-oh. It's the wide. Yeah, might not be. Might cab. not be good for this. What you got? You got something? Got a knife. Try it. Um, so I can get it. Pass me. Ooh, that, that would have. That could have ended so badly. <laughs> nah. Knife just like. Whoosh. What's your F1 team while he's doing this? There you go. 
my don't cut your thumb off, please. No, he's not. I'm not. I know. I got it. One, that's that's a that's a brewer's knife. He knows how to use that. There it is. It's my coming F1 after team? a little bit, but not bad. Yeah. Do you have a team? So I've figured this out, and I'll answer your question as you think about it with like a, a question. Um, we don't need the napkins. You're okay. Thanks, Hayden. Um, I do this in Premier League soccer too. I'm a fan of players slash drivers. I, I don't have team affiliation yet in my life. Gotcha. So as soon as Andretti launches the U.S. team in 2023 or four, that'll be my team. But right now. <laughs> I just, there are certain drivers I like. So that's why I asked have, about Ferrari. Do you have a hope for the Andretti driver? Like, do you think he's going to That's a great question. pull from the same pool? Or is he going to go get some, like, NASCAR name that's going to get people buying tickets? Mm, you know who I I hope he gets? Which I don't, I don't think he can. Sorry. It's just stimulus. Would now. you like a stimulus it's glass, just stimulus Jake? Now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Don't cut your hand on this, please. <laughs> just I got hold it. it. Hold it up top. There yeah, you go. I got it. That that's, was that, that's a newly that was a, engineered. Was a clean, that's a newly engineered glass. Clean break there. Yeah. Sorry there. Um, I hope he goes after some of the young, like F two drivers. Okay. Um, that would make the most sense. I just wonder if yeah. he's gonna pull the ultimate American and be like just claim people <laughs> he's like already like contracted Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s Jr. right right or something I don't know I don't know either um before we get too far down the F1 rabbit hole what is this oh um so this beer is brewed with Floodland this is a Floodland collab um come up to oh, that yeah. microphone yeah I want people to hear this yeah so Floodland uh is my friend Adam um he originally started uh, with Holy Mountain mm. out in Seattle and then started his own project. I think Adam makes, I mean, his saisons speak for themselves. Oh um, he works with fruit in a way that I think he is making the best beers with wine fruit in the country for sure. It's a beautiful bottle too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, but Adam and I have been friends for a long time. I love to tell this story. Um, Adam and I became friends because I didn't mean to, but I made fun of him on <laughs> Untapped. Uh, back in the day, Untapped was just a brewer thing um, mm -hmm. before it became like a and consumer I liked it then. Yelp. I yeah. liked it then. Yeah, it's a good. Uh, it's a good time. But I checked in my first Holy Mountain beer, and it was super bready. And uh, to the point, and for me, the bread that he used uh, always smells like Band-Aids. And, uh, but like uh, maybe a more complimentary way would have been leather. But I checked it <laughs> oh, I in see, I see. Yeah. and I said, uh, Band-Aids and pineapples. And immediately he responds and is like, you never want to hear that. <laughs> and so I'm brewing at Wolves and People one day and this dude walks in and he's sitting below the brewing platform and he was like, Band-Aids and pineapples, man. I'll never fucking forget that. <laughs> and so at that moment, we just started planning this collab and it has fallen through because of so many crazy things. Like a, he had a kid, COVID. And so we have been planning a collab for almost five years. Mm. Um, and so... This collab is we brewed Cavern Him, my Kolsch, um, and then aged it in a barrel of his, uh, or a couple barrels with his culture in there. But we let it sit and we fermented it with my Kolsch yeast. So there was only a little bit of the residual sugar left for his kind of culture to get in there and do some work. And dude, it's brilliant. It's so good. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Did I you had, try it yet? Because I've this had is... so many people reach out about how badass this beer is, and I'm like, still haven't fucking tried it. <laughs> this is, is this your first go? Right here, first sip. Whoa. Yeah. What's your what's Cheers. your initial off the sip? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean it's like this these beers I feel like are so hard to find. Mm -hmm. It's like truly a mixed culture beer, but Ooh. The acid is so perfect. 
that's I one of the best acid so much and this is like that style of beer that's one of the best i've had in a minute the cool thing is is that you can taste the cavern him mm-hmm. but also taste all that like breadiness a little yep. bit of acid character mm-hmm. and barrel content yep. but that's such a man cool so marriage good. between that that's a really good collab yeah. it's fun because you rarely get those collabs where you feel like you're drinking both breweries but i i went into this collab knowing just because adam and i there are a few people that i f- talk beer with still and adam is one mm. and i don't know of many people i feel like the wavelength is so specific and familiar and so making beer with him's like a joy so is this really all he does That's super stylistically cool. uh yeah he makes i think he told me that he made 220 barrels last year which is like nothing mm. um but he's like well, so i mean what no 220 <laughs> barrels but it's probably the most sought after beer in the country so i would put say that into over, put that into layman's terms that would like, be what does that that would be me brewing 20 times in a year. Okay. Yeah. Which, which we, how many we, times do you brew in a year? Oh, 220 times. Gotcha. Yeah. Super, super small stuff. But all of his, I mean, the dude releases only sophisticated stuff. I mm. mean, it's. What a you cool, know what what a cool label, too. Yeah, mm. well, the label's great. The taste is amazing. It's beautiful. F- four to four and a half percent. Yeah. Well, come on, dude. Do you think I was going to do anything different? No, but <laughs> I've also never seen a label have a range. Oh, 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 the range yeah. on it. I four thought you to were four and a half percent. Lower. No, like, no, no, I love come that. On. I love that. Um, but I've never seen a range yeah. of ABV. So it's kind of a wine thing, too, to do, like, the vintage yeah. range. And, uh, and so I think for him, I don't know this, but it was probably, he had the label done before the beer was attenuated. Mm, So he was guessing. And he's like, I love this about him. He's like, dude, breweries are so full of shit. Almost every beer is completely wrong on their alcohol content. And he is like very intense about making sure that whatever that label reads is what you're drinking. Mm. And so what's not on there is like, where are they? Uh, he's in Seattle. He's in Seattle. Okay. Yeah. So his hit all of his beer is sold through membership, and it's like no chance of getting it. Mm. <laughs> it's, I love that. Yeah. It's <laughs> I very, might lean on you to get a membership for that beer. Oh my gosh, dude! I it's one of those things I would never even ask him for it because he's just like the dude has people like knocking down. Dude, that is delicious beer. Thank yeah. you for bringing that. Yeah. No, I'm happy to finally. Love it. Get my paws on it too. Take the rest of that to Melissa. No, that is, that's that is awesome. That is we're gonna finish beer. this bottle after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so before we go, yeah. so there is an F one fan group slash watch parties yeah. being held at Heirloom, which you haven't come to yet. I um, haven't, and I'm really sad that I okay. wasn't able to come the last time. Well, Australia Grand Prix is. I don't know how is to it say this it. Sunday. Is it Saturday night or Sunday morning? Either way, it's at midnight, either yeah. Saturday night or Sunday morning if is when the race starts. Yeah, you just basically need to Don't go to bed Saturday night. Yeah, after yeah. whatever bar you're at on Saturday night, come to Heirloom. The one thing, so there's a Facebook group. You can search for it. It's like Tulsa F1 Fan Club or something like that. Um, there will be probably some sort of food well, yeah. to be determined, but obviously Heirloom beers and cool people hanging out and, and watching the races, so it's, it's fun. Yeah. You asked me earlier what my driver is or ask your I, team or whatever but yeah who do you I, are you a fanboy of anyone not not really uh i you know this is gonna sound sad because i know that it's not necessarily super light but i am a red bull fan no nope, you're but, done but i <laughs> but kidding, i kidding. like i actually like checo i love sergio perez i hate max for but but i with a passion i, I like yeah. hamilton as a driver better Good. That Does that make sense? Like, I, it's it's kind of soul. weird. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's like kind of like trying to not like Kobe Bryant as a basketball player. Fair. Exactly. You know, it's like, no, but yeah. I, I love the idea. I love Red Bull. Like, I'm not talking in F1 terms. I love Red Bull. I love what they do with like extreme not, sports and yeah, like that whole world. The culture of yeah, Red Bull. Uh, the culture of Red Bull. I love, I know people that work at Red Bull. That I are don't involved, like Max Verstappen. But not only Verstappen, but Christian Horner. 
I just I, I don't like Dude, them. I like I, Christian I, Horner. Do you? Uh, we <laughs> had this conversation. Christian yeah, Horner's yeah. like, I'm gonna start some shit today. Yeah. I don't know who it's gonna be with. And you know what I heard someone say on an F1 podcast that I was listening to that actually made sense and made me respect him a little more is that that's probably a calculated thing that he's doing. hundred percent. Where when you when he gets the attention and he gets the press and he gets the negativity and he gets all of this, you know who's not getting it? The rest of the team exactly. and the drivers and all of that. And so when I now he hasn't said that. So either uh, he's already like you can see him mic'd yeah. up talking and going, he's just waiting for a wrong turn. Sure. To be like, I'm gonna need you to look at that again. And yeah. Yeah, I mean he calls in everything. I mean, plus he's married to a he's, spice girl, so fuck well, him. Well he takes a helicopter to work. He, he's fine. He's good. He's okay. Yeah. 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 He's but I wanted to be fine. married to a spice girl. So it, maybe it's jealousy. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit of jealousy coming through. Yeah, it's it's probably uh, the estate with the horses and he's the spice an appropriate girl. guy or, to be jealous. Yeah, I mean it's like, come on, dude. Yeah, like, fucking. And he here. has like some sort of ranch in England. Yeah, like Berkshire or whatever oh, it was called, I'm sure or whatever. He's got yeah. Multiple places yeah. that he could live if he wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> so this weekend, Australian Grand Prix at yeah. Heirloom, Saturday night slash Sunday morning. Yeah, midnight. We've never. We've never done this kind of thing. No. And yeah. then the so 6 a.m. will come quick. Midnight? Yeah. Oh, well, man. Are you going to be there? I'm going to be there for sure. I'll I'll be there for an F1 race at midnight. We'll clink some glasses. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll try good. and be there. It'll be good. It'll be fun. All right. So when can people, outside of that timing, when can people come to Heirloom? What's your, what's your hours? Where can they find you on social? Like all that fun stuff. Yeah. So if you just look up Heirloom Rustic Ales, Instagram, Facebook, take it right to us. Um Three to nine is the standard. Um, and then the weekend hours are a little different. I think we're open to like 10 or 11 on Friday, Saturday. Nice, man. Yeah. Cool. Yep. And then noon to six. No, noon to seven on Sunday. I don't work the bar anymore. <laughs> man, it's a rarity when Jake's behind the bar. <laughs> and yeah. no one wants it. No one wants yeah, that. I'm, I'm in the same boat. People are like, what are your hours? And I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That is, Lisa's changed them so many times. That I don't is know. off my plate for sure. <laughs> I'm going to pour a sip of this so that I can cheers you and thank you for coming yeah. on the podcast. No, thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Need a little bit more. Sure. You can't cheers with an empty glass. No, nah, we can't. And I just noticed I did cut my finger when that glass broke. Oh. But not bad. First We're okay. bloodshed. We're okay. Cheers, Jake Miller. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. Thanks Man, for and, bringing us some badass finally shit. Finally, we have you. Yeah. yeah. I know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out. It I, did. Even today, I was like, "Man, I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna have like COVID or something." <laughs> I was waiting for the <laughs> oh text, gosh. like, "Oh, I can't make it." Like, Damn it. Yeah, I was like, right. what other thing can go wrong on this? I know. All right, we'll let you get out of here. Thanks, Thanks. for doing this. Yeah, we'll be right Cheers. back. Cheers. Cheers. That was Jake Miller. Cheers to him for coming on the uh, the podcast. And yeah, we went a bunch of different places, and we we yeah, we fun. tasted a bunch of beer. We broke glasses. It was, it was, cut, it was fingers. A, yeah. cut fingers. It, yeah. was, it was a great conversation. Tweaked our already bad ankle, trying to run jackets outside. Like we did all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was cool because not only did we dive into Tulsa, but we dove into what this area's conservation could mm. actually tie into. Yeah. Jake's big in that world. If you, if you, you know, if you didn't know that before, now you do. Like that's, that's and, his heart. You know, as a, as a hunter myself, uh, I, I would consider myself a conservationist, but he himself is actually in the forefront yeah. of that mind and actually on boards and whatnot and actually making a, a huge difference within this state, not only for, you know, water here is so in abundance mm. and can't be forgotten about. It's true. But uh, he he makes a huge difference in that area and helps. You know, I'm not necessarily a fisherman, but I am a hunter. But all of that ties into each other. 100%. And yeah. it, it's a symbiotic relationship, and it's cool what he's doing. Couldn't have said it better myself. Good show? Yeah, good show. Show, episode, whatever. Yeah, ep call episode, it. whatever. We'll be back next week on The Tasting Room. See you guys. Cheers. Thank you.